Hey everybody, hello, happy Thursday, good morning. It is Reaper Pro Tips time with me, your host Anne, and disembodied hands, Quindy, Justin, and uh, sometimes John. Sometimes John. Hello, hello. I probably only have a couple of people on because just Justin went live. Because I forgot to text Justin that, hey, I dude, I went live um, many minutes ago. Oops. My fault. My fault. So hi, hi, as you all filter in. Hello, hello, hello. It's a good day. It's a good day. But I have a song stuck in my head. Like a serious song stuck in my head. I don't know what it is. But this morning, I have Carly Simon's You Are So Vain stuck in my head. It's just, it won't get out. It won't. <laughs> Did you hate it when that happens? Like when you have a song in your head? Now, I like that song. I like Carly Simon in general, but uh, I don't want it running through my head, especially when I'm prone to breaking into song at odd moments. I don't want to like, you know, be like singing that song all day. Yeah, don't you, Quindy? Don't you? Uh-huh. So I've got to like tame myself. I can't even hum it while I'm on stream. <laughs> It's all right. It's all right. I, I'm pretty sure. Well, our, our half-orc wizard could be vain, I guess, but uh, she's pretty. But um, yeah, we're going we're to do some basing today. I was trying to decide if I wanted to do a cutout or if I wanted to do a build-up around. Um, so we're playing with some cork. This is really thin cork. This is the kind of cork you get for coasters. So it's really easy to find online and uh, at places like Hobby Lobby and Michael's. Usually they'll have it for people who make their own coasters. So uh, totally cool one of the first things we're gonna do is we're just gonna actually even if we don't do a cutout we're still going to draw a line around the base just because i want to kind of know um if i do decide to do the cutout because i do want to build out on the base from her i want to use this as a kind of armature either way whether i do a complete circle and do a cutout or whether i put her on top of it and build up her base is really flat and thin, so it's very, very doable to just uh, sculpt and use this as an armature without even um, having to inset her into it at all. Uh, I'm looking for a pen. There's a Sharpie. It's a tiny Sharpie. Tiny but mighty. Mm -hmm. Drawing a regular bit around the outside of her base. Just kind of keeping it. And then I want to put my um, my actual base. I decided on this one. Put that kind of over the top to make sure. Yeah, that looks like it's going to fit just fine. Um, I like an irregular shape just to build off of. I don't see any reason to not do an irregular shape. I also want enough room. Ah, but we had talked about um, putting her up against the back of that, hadn't we? Eh. I don't know. I don't know. Actually, I think I have enough room. Do I have enough room for my mystic circle? Let's look. Let's kind of draw in kind of a circly type of shape. And make sure that I can fit a circle, a circly kind of shape, into this very um, roughly shaped piece of cork. And yeah, answer is yeah, yeah, I could do a circle. That's a decent circle. And does she fit inside of it? Yeah, I will need to do the putty build up. It pretty much uh, will it's inter intersect two edges of her base and then we'll have the front. So, but I can fit a magical circle in here. I'm just gonna have to build over her base and then probably carve into it. So this is pretty much just some basial, 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 base, basial. Um, there's totally a different meaning for that word and I don't care at this moment. <laughs> Um, basial, uh, brainstorming, actually, where I'm like, ah, because most of the time when I'm heading into a base, I kind of have an image of what I want, but I haven't really refined it in my head yet. So the first thing is to like, kind of ask myself, what are the main features of the base that I want to do? And the main features of my base is I want it to be kind of a rocky crumbling, um, like almost like a piece of floor or so piece of a building that used to be there that's mostly uh, destroyed now. And I want that to have a summoning circle um, inside of it or on top of it. So those two things I needed to make sure I could do within the context of the size of the base that I was using, which is this guy. You can see what I've done before. Hey there, Bob and Julie. 
Now, now I get nervous because Bob and Julie are the putty masters, and I'm gonna putty today. <laughs> it's green stuff day. Green stuff, green. Because now that we've got our base mapped out, we can start cutting it. And hopefully this will show you guys. Where's my tiny cutting mat? I have a tiny cutting mat in here somewhere. Oh, that's my big cutting mat. Yay, tiny cutting mat. Because I don't want to hurt my paper or my desk. Well, my desk is glass. So, I mean, there's a reason I chose a glass desk impervious to Anne. This is why. So... We will take our, and these are very handy, by the way, these tiny little, just like three inch cutting things, especially when you don't have a lot of room. I mean, we're working on miniatures most of the time. We don't need a huge cutting board, right? Unless you're Ed, and then you're working on megatures, right? But green stuff for green stuff. Yes. So I'm, and I, and you don't even need like a real, like solid cut on this actually having kind of a, a rough cut is good because this is crumbling stone so we're probably going to crumble it a bit more on the edges so we don't necessarily want a real clean cut on the edge here and we'll be sculpting probably over it filling it in a little bit doing stuff like that once you have it cut you can just kind of break it that helps too to get a rough stony texture on parts of it I'm going to keep all of these little bits that I'm cutting off, by the way, guys, because I might use those to kind of flesh out the base a little bit. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to make actually kind of a rough, very rough cut around the outside of this. You don't even need to, like, put much of a cut into it to break it like I just did. See, it comes right out. I didn't even cut more than a third of the way through that. That's the nice thing about cork. It's so friendly and easy to use. Whether you're using it as an armature, as I'm about to, I may actually use little parts of it. Also, keeping little bits uh, around or even a bigger bit around to do um, use as a stamp to get a rough texture. I use, do that all the time with cork. If you don't have a rock. Because a lot of times the crumbly uh, edges of your cork are actually like more in scale for rock texture than an actual rock in your hand is. So I like to do that a lot. So anyway, let's get down to crumbling off the rest of this. I left a tiny piece here that I can just use my knife to break off. And I can choose to leave a little piece there if I want or not. Sometimes I decide I'd rather sculpt it. It really depends on the texture of rock that you're planning to do. I keep these little crumblies, though, too, because if you stick them into green stuff, you can get some good uh, good added texture. So I'm mostly going to pull, pull bits off and make a ragged edge in line with my marker using um, just a Sharpie pen, which works fine for cork. I won't leave the, I won't keep the tiny, tiny grit because they're hard to keep track of and they tend to just get everywhere. So I'll brush those off of my pad and um, just put those in the trash after we're done. But the bigger pieces I do save just in case I want to use it. And if you see like kind of a crack or that the cork is weakening here along the edge, you can play with that. Like, I kind of like to take advantage of that. That's, um, that's the world telling me that giving me a creative suggestion. So the fact that this part wants to crack, I'm going to actually work the, the tip of my X-Acto and just make that a crack in the stone. Because, you know, when the world tells you that, you know, hey, you could do this here, you should, you should listen to it every once in a while. You shouldn't always listen to it, you know. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. One of my favorite sayings. Often applied to fantasy and science fiction. <laughs> just because you can do something does not mean you should. So I see this little crack and I can use my knife to accentuate that little crack. Because, you know, then I can decide maybe to keep this portion or I can sculpt over and, and remember my crack there and get a little bit more height to it and make it a deeper crack when I go to sculpt green stuff over it. So don't overthink too much because you may cover a lot of it up with green but if you see a feature like that you can always then accentuate it with the skin of green that you put over the top all right like this this little trailing edge down here that's very stony it's very natural so i'm going to keep it i'm going to take off some of the 
little bits of excess that are really thin because they're going to be very fragile. But I'm going to keep a little bit of that because that tapering off is what stone does. Hey, Miss Dim, how's it going? We're constructing a base for Ms. Orc because Ms. Orc is my favorite, uh, half orc rather, is my favorite mini that I have uh, painted lately. That seems to be the qualifier for getting Anne to do a better base for you is if you are the latest favorite mini. Uh-oh. David's speakers are on. I may need to go. If his Discord starts going off like crazy, I'll have to go over and uh, turn that off. I don't know. It's pretty soft, though. I don't know if you guys could hear it when it went off with its little alert beep. Let me know if it gets annoying. I usually remember to go over and turn it off, but I was distracted this morning. It's almost the weekend, guys. It's Thursday. I'm so excited. Today's going to be a great day. Like, I have a busy day planned, but I also have um, hanging out with you guys planned. Because, well, at least those of you who show up for my stream, right? Because it's Thursday. So that'll be the Painting Big stream over on twitch.tv slash painting big. That'll be at about 4 p.m. USA Central Time. So if you're bored before Reaper Live or you want my companionship while you're making dinner before Reaper Live, you should come on over and hang out. Thank you, Quindy. And Quindy just put the uh, link in the text, so you can go over and follow me. And maybe Twitch will alert you. Maybe. <laughs> actually, if Twitch does alert you and you click through, that actually gives Twitch positive reinforcement, and it is more likely to alert you into the, next, the next time. Or at least so it has seemed with my own Twitch alerts. But if you don't give Twitch positive enforcement, Twist, Twitch just goes all passive-aggressive on you. It, it doesn't really have a very healthy relationship with us. All right. I like that little, actually, this triangular chunk. I think I'm going to keep that. I'm going to put that over in the keep it pile. So I'm, I'm liking a rough texture here. So we're working with that. Oh, you don't even, I mean, just do it. Like, cork is so much fun. Like, cork is its own inspiration, Crows. Just get, get a big sheet of cork and start ripping it up. And when you get a piece that looks really interesting, play with it like this. Then find a mini for it. It's super easy. Because you can landscape it as any terrain. Anything from snow and rocks to grass to sand to desert to whatever. You can do anything to peaceful garden. You can do anything. Cork is so good. Like, it is, and it's cheap, too, so you don't have to have to feel bad about ripping up chunks of it. Like, it's, it's so inexpensive, and it's so much fun to use, and if you want to, like, build up a bigger base, Cork is your, your base for that. Like, it, it is inexpensive, easy to work with, really user-friendly, responds well to glue, you know, a green stuff adheres well to it. It, it, it. I just go on and on and on and on. Like, Cork. Cork, it's all about Cork. The only downside of it is it's lightweight, so if you're trying to put a big like heavy model on top of a base that's built up with cork, you're going to want to reinforce it. But other than that, cork, it's all about the cork. You could use dowel rod to like sink down through the middle of a base like that, just so you can peg the monster into the top of it. Um, and then you're going to have to weight the bottom, but because cork is so easy, you could dig out the bottom and put heavy stuff down there to weight it. So it's like it's cork. I just come back to cork. It's just all about cork, guys. All about it. Today's, today's lesson is all about cork. All right, so this is so much fun, though. Like, this is so zen. This is one of my favorite things to do is to just get ideas by working and ripping apart cork. Like, it's super fun. Like, I'm forgetting that I wanted a much closer, uh, much closer rim there. I, I'm going to have to make sure, like, I'm probably going to have to rip this more. Just to make sure it fits on my base. Here, let me... Like, I need to kind of grab it. That's why you keep your base close by. Because you're like, all right, see, I'm definitely over the edges there. I'm going to have to either scale it back or chunk out more over here to make it fit. So I'll have to chunk down, but that's okay. What that means, though, that tells me early is that Anne, stop screwing around and just start cutting this stuff apart. Start cutting this stuff apart and see. And you know what? If this doesn't work and we reduced it too much, like if you can definitely reduce it to the point where you're like, wow, my cork is tiny now. I don't know if I can work with this. Um, you can definitely just grab a new piece. It's so inexpensive. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can use foam too, um, Lord Nobody. I have a harder time with foam and the thing, I really like the texture. I think cork gives a better rock texture when you flake it like this. Like you can see it's really natural. Um, and so it takes care of that for you. Like you don't have to sculpt it further to get a good rock texture like you do with foam. The other thing I don't like is the fumes when you're using um, the heat tools on foam. So uh, that's why I tend to go more toward the cork, but foam is also a good builder. It has the same, it has the same downside, which is lightweight, but that can be an upside if you're building a big diorama base where you really, really need to, uh, to reduce weight because you're going to be taking it to a show and you don't want it to weigh 50 pounds. Hey, wow. 21 months, Valendar. Congratulations and thank you. Huge thank you from the Reaper team for being absolutely awesome. There we go. Big chunk there. Don't know what I'm going to use that as, if anything. So I'm actually kind of chewing into my little original outline. And you'll do that. You'll just decide, oh, I need to minimize some stuff and I want some more texture here. Oh, I got a little bit of an overhang there. Now, if your cork does the opposite of this, where the foot is hanging out, and if it gets an overhang on the top, that can be a nice uh, starter for a cave. Somewhere to put a little critter or something or a mushroom or something underneath your base. So if you get that overhang, I just tossed it because I know it's not part of what I want to do. But you can work with it. That's also, it's something I've done in the past. I do have a lot of little chewy bits on here, though, so I'm going to actually empty them into the trash at this point because they're starting to uh, sneak off of the cutting mat and fall in with the rest of the cork bits that I tend to keep. So hold on. Let me just empty this into my handy, handy trash can. Possibly, like, the most useful thing to have at your desk is a trash can. So this is developing, but as we can see, now what we need to do is we need to fit it. We need to make it fit. Because it's way too big right now. Like the top fits. Like when I said it, the top almost completely fits. But I need to figure out where, what I want to keep and what I want to get rid of. And I want to figure out also, am I going to keep the whole summoning circle? Or am I going to truncate it around the back here? Have her toward the back of the base. And have a little bit of room on the front just to landscape. Just to add some grasses or something to tell us um, where she is other than on a rocky, you know, piece that maybe used to be masonry that has a summoning circle on it. Um, hey, Cookie Tigress, six months. Happy half a year anniversary. Half a, half a sub anniversary. Half sub anniversary. That's what it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. Prime sub too. Sweet. All right. Because I tend to like, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to like a little bit off center bases. I like to put the model back a little bit. Um, because the rear isn't really like necessary for the story. And if you have enough up front to tell the story, you don't really need a lot of all this. You can cut it all off. So I'm kind of, I'm veering toward that. Cause I do like to put a little bit of, of like grass or snow or whatever, whatever I think is, um, appropriate to like the setting where she is. I like to suggest place a little bit with my bases. So I am going to take out, you can just hold it down and kind of kind of uh, chunk out some of this. Again, do keep these big pieces. You might want them. If not for this project, for a future project. When I get that there, I'm going to move it over a little. I don't want to get too square. Or maybe I do, because if I do decide that it's masonry, I'm going to probably put some uh, flagstone lines in it. So having this more regular shape will actually uh, enhance the illusion that she's standing in the ruins of a previous structure. So... And other than that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up killing a lot of this. Probably just going to do a big slice right down the back. And again, don't be afraid of just overworking it. If you slice off, quote unquote, too much. Ah, and uh, you feel like, oh, no, I made a mistake. You can grab another piece of cork. I mean, how long has this taken me? Not very much time. Um, so I, it's not like you're wasting a ton of time. Yeah, I think I'm just going to use part of the summoning circle. I'll just use it in the front. And I'll fade out the back. And 
And again, having the cutting brand here is really nice. Always cut away from yourself if you're doing this sort of thing. The cork is liable to give way suddenly. Now, the other thing we could do if we wanted to include the full summoning circle, because we still have a, a little tiny bit of room to do that, is that we could take this cork and chip it away just on the bottom. So we could essentially make sure this bottom section essentially hollowed out. And thus we could keep the whole circle, but it would still fit on the base. It would just be overhanging the back a little bit. And that's a pretty cool idea. So maybe we'll work that way. We'll work that way and see what we can do. Ah, cutting towards self. Must cut away from self, remember. Unpredictable knife movement means cutting away from self, even if you live dangerously like I do. Keeping all my big bits, throwing away all the little grit, because otherwise cork grit will get everywhere. It's pernicious. It's like little resin shavings and stuff. A coaster for the tiniest drink ever, yes. She's holding, I, I prefer not to think of that as a drink. I prefer to think of that as a potion of, I'm going to throw this at you and it's gonna explode. That's really what I think her expression is. That's why she's holding it the way she's holding it. She's not holding it by the handle like she's going to take a drink. She's holding it by the bottom like she's going to lob it. I think it's a potion of fireball explosion. A potion of blow you up. That's what the orcs would probably call it. Let me kind of look at this. And you're never, like, married to, like, an exact position here. Because you're going to scooch this around and figure out where the best position is for it. So don't overthink it. Um, I may switch and flop it over at this point and hollow out the bottom a little bit. So I can kind of nick away at the bottom. I'm not going to... If I see, like, parts sticking out here, that's fine. I just want the bottom to fit onto my base flat. That's the nice thing about cork being flat is it does adhere to your base very nicely. So, but you just don't want it overhanging that lip because that's going to lift it off the base a little bit, make it harder to uh, danger OJ. Yeah. But yeah, cork is so much fun. Like, do do play with cork for your minis. Like, and it doesn't have to be like a super special mini. You can just play with cork on any old base. And it'll just make the miniature look a little nicer because it, it raises them up just a tiny bit, which usually with 28 millimeter models makes them look more important and cool and taller. Um, so it can be a neat little thing to do just in general. And it's just fun to play with. Super fun. Whenever somebody tells you about something in the hobby, oh my gosh, that's super fun to play with. Like that should be your go sign. Like that, that's the go button. Hit it and run. Grab some cork. Start playing around. Because it is fun. It's fun and relaxing. It's very zen because you're like trying to create naturalistic rock shapes with your knife and ripping away little pieces of, of rubble, right? Like what could be more zen than that? It's like a bonsai tree except with cork. Maybe that's why I like it so much. All right, so I'm just going to see that that fits, and I've still got a little bit that goes over the edge here and here. Everything else is really nice, and you see that kind of that recessed look that I'm getting back here. So I will fine-tune this a little bit um, just to make it more interesting. And uh, also, the more I take away, the more I'll be able to sculpt with some green stuff over there to suggest, like, chunks of stone. So I, I'm keeping that in mind as well. So I do want to get rid of uh, this little bit here and a little bit of that. So what starts out as a feature can become a liability. And you should be open to that. Like, don't get super married. And this is true of anything in miniature painting. Don't get super married to a concept or a thing, a particular aspect of the work. Because if something changes partway through, you want to have the freedom and the happiness to just kind of embrace that and run with it. Like, the most important part is that you are having fun with your creativity in the hobby. And so, don't get stressed if something isn't turning out the way you think it should turn out. If you see that it's suggesting you go a different way, just run that way. 
Even if you end up not liking it as much, it's just a learning experience. It's not a big deal. There will be other minis. And if you really don't like the basing or some other aspect of the model, it's not like you can't repaint or re-sculpt or rebase it. If you really hate it. But it may grow on you, so never, uh, never count that out. All right, let's get rid of some of these little chunkies and see where we are. My hope is that we get this set glued and the green stuff at least generally applied, even if we don't get the circle completely carved in. The, th the carving of the circle probably needs to wait till everything is set. I couldn't decide if I wanted to kind of do it with um, sculpting tools or if I wanted to wait and do it when the green stuff, stuff had set. And I'm kind of in favor of doing it when the green stuff, green stuff has set. Unless I decide to work mostly with the surface of the cork and not really put a skin of green over it. If I decide to just slice it out of like the cork surface, because um, I want it to be a little bit inset, just a tiny bit, uh, then I will, then I can move ahead. But if I want to do green, a green skin over the top of it, because the thing with cork is that it doesn't give you a lot of top texture. It's very, very obviously flat. And it's very, very obviously cork. So usually I would use green and texture this a bit. And if I wanted to suggest flagstones, I could do it then. Um, you can run in and, and like putty <coughs> or texture this with a knife and tools, but it's just, um, it's a little more controllable if you put a thin skin of green over the top and then just use whatever texture you want as a stamp. <coughs> Cork side, yes. It doesn't take much looking. It's on Amazon. Um, this is coaster cork, Lord nobody. So if you, uh, if you want to make your own coasters, you know, cork, this is, that's that stuff. And it's about, I think a quarter inch thick. Let me do a measure. Usually they sell it by thickness. Oh, maybe it's three, looks like three eighths. Yeah, this is three eighths inch. And it's, but it's the standard cork you would use for coasters. I'm just checking my fit here. On this type of base with a rim on it, you can usually slide the thing back and forth and see if you've got a good fit. And what I'm seeing, and again, I have to also remember I want to, um, yeah, I think I need to take this part off. Much as I like this part, it is definitely impinging at this point. So I'm going to just take that off with the knife. David's back at work today it is so funny how like now that I've had like time without him with him being at work and then yesterday he worked from home again and now today he's gone again. I could see like how my productivity actually is so much better when I don't have my distraction around. He's a wonderful distraction. Don't get me wrong, but Oh boy, I'm so much more productive when I'm alone in the office. It's not his fault either. It's just when you've got your other person there, especially your other person who you, you know, love to hang out with. You're just like, you're always thinking of things to go and tell them or, you know. Or they're saying, oh, did you see this story about X, you know. Oh, that, uh, yeah, the brown cork rhymer is what I actually tend to use more often. Um, we had somebody post up the link to that, but this stuff is the thick stuff you're talking about. This stuff is actually, I find it more useful uh, when you're building up diorama bases or big bases. I used a lot of this when I was working on the Frost Giant Queen. It is actually my favorite cork because it flakes into big boulders. And I think it gives a great texture, but on a 28 millimeter model, I think the smaller cork is the way to go. Um, I, I use that bigger cork for, uh, for giants, um, ogres, uh, and 54 millimeter and up figures mostly. This is not a cutting mat coaster. This is just the smallest, uh, smallest cutting mat they sell, which I love because I hate things that take up a lot of space. I hate it. I work in a very small area because I'm under the camera here, guys. So essentially if I have to whip out my huge cutting mat, cause I do have one that's like a, a nine inch or an eight inch one, 
it just takes up so much room. I have to shove everything out of the way and then I have to put it down. And then when I want to lift it up, inevitably all this stuff has crept onto it. So the tiny cutting mat, especially when you're just doing little base work, is so handy. It's lovely. Like, I love it. They don't make good coasters because the water rolls right off of them. Ask me how I know. Yeah, interesting. <clears throat> yeah, cork of all types. Just a really great general building up material. Let me see. Do we fit? Do it if it's if it fits, it sits. I think it fits. Does it fit in the way I want it to? I technically, if I wanna be able to slide if I don't want this gap back here. Just eyeball it. It looks like I need to take out a little bit more of this. Because I'd rather not have a gap back there. Any scenics I want to pretty much put on the front. This is where you can just use your knife to kind of scrape away at it. Do some cuts, but not a whole lot, because now you're refining. So now you want to, like, kind of keep an eye on, what am I doing? All right. I want to be able, my goal is to be able to slide this into the back and have it abut the rim here, but with no, no slide over, and it fits nicely. It kind of catches when I push it back there. When I'm, I'm essentially pushing it this way. But when it catches on the lip of the base, then I know that I'm set. And uh, that's good. It's got some overhang in the back, but that's just adding character at this point. I can always take that down a little bit more if I want to. I can still fit my entire circle on there. The model is going to be placed pretty well. She's like kind of centered. I might want to take off a little bit of this or I might want to keep it. And I have some space in the front to do grass and other scenics on. So all in all, I think I like this. I'm going to take out that piece because I don't like it very much. This is now where I'd refine the shape into something more pleasing. So like if I feel like the shape is more regular anywhere, this is where I'm going to try to make it into kind of a, a, a pleasing and asymmetrical shape. Which is actually the reason not to take any of this chunk off, because then I've got a little bit of a different feel on that side. I do have a little bit of loose cork, though. If you've got little grits kind of hanging off, you want to get those off before you glue. Back in the office one day a week. Mac. Cool. Uh, nope. I don't generally like working with foam pendrake because of the way it reacts to like some paints and sprays uh, and because of the toxicity if you're using heat on it. I also find, as I mentioned, that cork is a far more organic material and that I enjoy working with the cork and it gives me a better natural texture out the gate. Um, I could see working with foam if you're doing science fiction stuff where you need super clean edges and you still want it to be lightweight and workable. I could see doing that because it's easier to do super thin foam than like styrene, although you probably still need to use a styrene base to keep it uh, flat, I assume. Yeah, plaster works too, especially small amounts of it. Like it gets heavy if you try to use it on a big base. <laughs> One day we can try to figure out if you can get away with it. Of course you can get away with it, Mac. Of course. Ah, until you can't. <laughs> Now, now. It's educational, right? It's educational programming. All right, let me see. I still have a little bit. Just kind of take a really close, close critical look at your base. If you see little bits that are sticking out that don't look like stone and that are kind of look like they might be kind of falling off or wanting to come off, just get them off now. Excellent. I think that's going to work. I think it's going to run. I think that dog will run. All right. Boop. Yeah. Yeah. 
So when you use super glue with cork, it kind of saturates the cork. It will still stick. It will make the cork harder and more brittle. So you do want, before you apply super glue in any way to cork, you do want to um, make sure that you're pretty much done carving it. Um, uh, some people, a lot of people will use PVA glue instead, like Elmer's all purpose. Uh, and that works, but it does not work fast. And I tend to be impatient. So here I'm going to use, I could use Zapagat, but that would soak in more. So instead, I'm probably going to use my, uh, my Loctite. Hopefully I still have enough of, uh, enough glue in this one. I just ordered a new one. But the, uh, the Super Gel is probably the best one to use to glue this down. I do need to question, okay, do I need to do anything else that's going to require me to remove this from the space? I don't think so. We're going to we're go. Let's go. Oh, yeah, exactly, Mac. That's my, yeah. I just don't feel that foam is, like, foam is cheaper. And so if you need to do something big, it makes sense. Uh, but if you're not doing something big, I think cork is... If you're trying to do stone shapes, cork is where it's at. But yeah, since she was doing something different, of course. But foam heads are... You can't do a cork head. That would be too expensive. But yeah, definitely uh, paint them with just straight up acrylic water base first before you spray stuff. Oh, I got a little bit of tiny thing here. I've got to take that off. Now, one thing that we can do if we want, because we do have a little bit of a gap here, is we can pick up some of our little um, chunks of uh, cork and shove them into that gap that the glue is coming out of to kind of uh, disguise it. So you can see the little glue coming out there. And if you want to, if you feel like there's room and you I don't like the look of that gap, you can just take a little tiny grit piece of cork and stuff it into that glue. It'll just set there like it always belonged there. We're going to leave that to set. We're going to look at our orc. We're going to say, all right, is it time for green stuff now? We're, we, we still have it. Now, if we want to make her really solid on here, guys, we should probably pin her through her bottom into the plastic base. Um, I don't really need to because I'm planning to green stuff over this tiny base she's got. So since I'm going to do that, if the green stuff is and plus glue, I will glue her down. Um, those two things together will stick her very nicely onto the base. But if she falls, it may not be enough. Now, even if she's pinned, if she falls, it may not be enough to save it. Uh, because she's metal, so she is heavier. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, nobody realizes that foam melts when you spray. Like, there has been... If you read any terrain-making articles using foam, they will warn you. Like, I was warned pretty early. Reaper's done a lot of foam work, of course, for past uh, conventions. Just Matt Clark used to whip together some fun stuff. So has so Ed in the past. Um, but, all right, what do I want to do next, guys? I think I want to glue her down and start green work. I think maybe no. I think one thing I want to do, though, is I do want to carve out a bit of this if I can. Um... The cork, because it's particulate, yeah, maybe this isn't going to work. Because the cork's particulate, even if you have a very sharp knife, it does tend not to carve as well as, like, set green stuff or definitely not as well as styrene. Yeah, I think I'll just go ahead at it. We'll just go with the green. The green is going to be easier. I can mark the green where I want to carve it afterwards, and that'll be all right. So I just need to remember that my circle does intersect with her two uh, parts there. I want to kind of center her. The base is a little off center, so it's going to look a little bit um, odd. But you just have to kind of figure out how she looks best on it. And even if you want to put her at a slight angle so that her face is more like the front of the figure and the rest of her is tilted like this arm might be tilted back a little bit like it is, like so. That's a, that's a way to add a more dynamic look to a straight, flat figure, is to tilt it a little bit on the base. Oh, there actually, there have been some for a while, Crows. Uh, ma um, testers did uh, a series of sprays that were actually okay for foam. Morning basement. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, just look out for the off-gassing. Like, make sure you're working in a very well-ventilated or open garage area. Yeah, testers is gone. Correct. Hey, Mobrock, thank you. Wow, you're almost to your sub -aversary. I'm going to have to sing this song next month. Awesome. Yeah, there are some sprays. I mean, the bottom line is if you're using foam products and you're using sprays, try it out beforehand. I personally, I wouldn't leave it to chance. I'd just grab some house paint and put a quick coat, just like with a huge brush, over the top of whatever I was working on, if it was a big project. Um, and then you're fine. It's just like with bones. The first coat is the most important coat, and after that you can do whatever. Alrighty. Oh, uh, yeah. Green work. And am I going to pin her? Mm, I don't think the pin is going to actually give me a ton of mileage. And she's going to be a display mini. So... Eh, I mean, it's really easy to pin through foam. But would it, will it make a difference? Or is it just going to waste time? I'm inclined to think it's just going to waste time. Ah, but I was right. I was talking about, um, sorry, I got distracted by people, people and comments and stuff. Oh my. Um, if you have a very flat model, like she is, right? She's a very like one dimensional model and you want to add more interest to her on her basing. You can do a couple things. One, you can make the base, uh, irregularly shaped, which will then not, not emphasize the fact that she herself is pretty two dimensional. The other thing you can do is, like I said, you could actually turn the model so that the viewer is looking at her. This is especially effective if the face, if she's looking off to the side like this one is. So you can kind of turn her so the face is more the focal point, the front, quote unquote. And if you do that, then the model looks more interesting, more visually interesting. So it's like the difference between... The difference between having your model sitting on a base like this. Here, let's get in focus. Boop, let's get this out of the backdrop so that we can actually focus on something other than the backdrop. So it's a difference between looking at the model like this and looking at the model like that. Do you see the dramatic difference? When you turn the model, so you're not just looking at the flat, but you're looking at like the face and then the arm is like drawn back like she's really going to throw that bottle. Then suddenly it looks more interesting. Do you see how that works? So when you have a very two-dimensional model, think about recentering them just a little bit. Just turn them like 15 degrees. If they've got a if they're looking straight forward, there's not much you can do, although even then a slight turn can help. Uh, especially if they're pointing their sword out to the side. But yeah, if you have a model that's that's whose head is turned slightly, you can play to that and get a much more interesting look by just turning the model just a tiny bit. Hopefully you guys are actually getting something from that. Sorry. When the chat is talking about like rattle cans and, and Anne is talking about miniature based composition, I tend to wonder if I'm shouting into the void. <laughs> Oh, well, if you miss it, you're just going to have to go back and watch the VOD. That's all I can say. There, when there comes a point, you cannot, you cannot, what was it? There was a great quote last night, actually. Actually, it, it doesn't have anything like necessarily to do with the context here, but I, uh, when I, when I hear great quotes, I like to share them. I don't remember who said this one, but it, uh, and it was actually, no, it was an ancient philosopher that said it. I can't believe, remember if it was Aristotle or somebody else. But they said, and they said, you cannot teach a man anything. You can only show him what is already within himself. So essentially, if it is within you to do a thing, you can learn the thing. But you can't, you know, you can't force anybody to learn anything, essentially. That person has to be receptive to learning it. So let's see. So there's the straightforward. And there's the angle. I have a, because I'm using the gel glue, I do have a little bit of time. I think I like that though. I think she's just 
turned enough. I like the front of the base being here. That's where the staff comes down, so that will help to anchor it as the front of the base. She is solidly on the base when I look at it from the top. She's in the middle of where I want the summoning circle to be, so she's properly placed. Now I just have to let her set while I grab my green stuff out and mix it up. Yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm going to like quote an ancient philosopher, I'm going to quote an ancient philosopher. And even though they used he and a man a lot, I mean, that's just the time, right? I'm not one of those people who gets upset that ancient people like, you know, had a bias one way or the other. The point is the point of the thing. You cannot teach, can, cannot like force anybody to learn anything. They have to have the will to learn it. Yeah, kinda. I don't like that one quite as much, Madam Gorgonzola, but you're right, it's a very similar sentiment, right? I like that one in the context of um, that sometimes we can't see opportunities that are right in front of us because we just aren't ready for them. And that's, I think, the core of that quote, right? And when we are open to looking for opportunities is when we see them. It's funny how blind we can be sometimes to stuff that can help us. There we go. We'll just, this is nice goopy green stuff. I can tell I just took this stuff out of the freezer. Good goopy green stuff. Triple G. Triple G rated. Right, exactly, Cranston. Oh, Galileo. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Yeah, I like these quotes since I'm, you know, trying to trying to improve my, my Anne self in various ways. I believe I can be a better Anne, so I actively search out ways to be a better Anne. Right now, I'm trying to optimize my time. Like, I feel like I waste a lot of time in my life. There's a lot of time. There's a lot of things I did that I'm not sorry about at all. Like all the time that I put into like miniatures and the community and paint and all that, like totally not wasted time. But in some other aspects of my life, I feel like, you know, I could have been more productive and I wasn't. So I'm really focusing on productivity and how to kind of make the most of my time now. I think Patreon is part of what has uh, driven me to that just because, you know, I have a lot of things I want to teach, and so if I can find a way to make sure that I can get to a lot of it, that that's a happy thing. So I'm using a bit more um, more blue in this one. This isn't as yellow. Uh, I want it to cure a little harder. I want it to be a little less soft. So I'm using... And I don't need anywhere... There isn't anywhere on this base where I need it to be super thin, right? So... Uh, whatever, War Shadow. <laughs> she would kind of, like, glare at you and probably turn you into a frog for calling her Quark. Alright, so we're gonna do the top first, because that's the important part. I have very sticky fingers. So I'm gonna take about half of this green stuff, because you never need as much green stuff as you think you will. Well, until you do. It's the tiniest one they make, Celery, and I love it because I'm doing things right under this camera and do not need to take up all my desk space with a huge hobby mat. I do have, like, an 8 or 9 inch one that I never use that sits in the drawer because I never need it. Like, only if I was working on a big diorama piece where I had to work all around with um, glues and stuff, then, then I could see it. All right, so the point here is that we need this green stuff to hide her base and to blend it in to a stony surround. And this is where my fingers being very sticky will not be helpful. So it's time to put some water on my fingers. I'm like, I can do this without water. Yeah, right, Anne. They will never come off your fingers. Not ever. It becomes much easier when you have water on your fingers. 
You still want to kind of smush it down, though. Luke, It doesn't need to be any, like, special, uh... You don't even really need it. To, you need it to go kind of all the way around. But we can smush it a lot. It's very fresh green stuff. We have a lot of time to work. We're going to use a flat tool first. There are a few flat tools you can use to smush it down. Big, big gigantic spoon is a good one, or any sh any spade shape. So either the the diamond shaped uh, spade or the uh, kind of oblong, roundy spade. I tend to like this one a little bit better later in the process. I tend to start with a bigger tool in the beginning. So I think I'm going to use big flat spade to uh, kind of mush this all together, and then I'll start refining it with the uh, other one. Uh, no, not really. Vitiol just keeps it from curing. So when we take the edge, we push it inward. I've got a lot of water here. Which could keep my green stuff from adhering. So I do need to grab a little Kleenex. And just kind of wick that out of there. So, boop. Kleenex is great for this stuff. When you need to, like, wick just a little bit of water, just put the little edge down. It just slurps it right up. We don't need the, the water other than to keep the tool from sticking to the green and vice versa. So the reason I'll switch to a more refined tool down the road is that um, I need this to a butt like right up next to her dress and this big tool, although it's doing an okay job, it's not optimal. Nope, not for big terrain stuff, Mist. When I'm sculpting um, parts of a figure, like when I'm doing like conversion work and not basing work, then I tend to rely very heavily on Tiny Spoon. But I do use uh, Giant Spoon here. Tiny Spoon's big friend. And I, I really like Angle Spade. Angle Spade is another one of my favorites. And I like um, Soft Spade too, this one. Those are my four favorite sculpting tools. Is Giant Spoon, Tiny Spoon, Angle Spade, and Soft Spade. I find that um, that's that's good enough. Those are those are a good enough lineup. Oh, lots of water there on the base too. Can you see it there? So let's get our Kleenex out, wick it off. It should dry pretty instantaneously with how uh, dry it is here. Just and if you have to, if you can't get it to go down, just grab your your spade tool and just kind of press down the Kleenex in the area, and then it will slurp up your water. You're all good. Um, I, I've gone away from using epoxy sculpt because it doesn't age as well. Um, I like the, David's got some wood putty that's very similar to epoxy sculpt in as far as its hardness is. And I find it's a little easier to work with and it, uh, stays good, like as long as green stuff. So I've run, away, I've gone away from epoxy. I do like the fact that you can thin epoxy with water and get a nice slurry, um, I've used that in the past, but lately, lately I have gone a little bit more away from epoxy. I used to be a big epoxy sculpt fan. So I've got a little bit of water on the cork underneath this. I can tell because the green doesn't want to uh, stick very well. If that's okay. I can give it a second. I've got plenty of time and I'm, this is actually working very quickly. So. Yep, Goroth. Um, Werner Clock, who I don't know if you're uh, aware of, of Werner. Uh, Werner always used just a dulled X-Acto blade for everything. Like, he would just dull one of these down, and he used it for every single thing on the figure, including the face. Any soft surfaces, anything. He could just do anything with that dulled X-Acto blade. That's the only sculpting tool he had. It was insane. Insane. But you just get used to, like, a particular tool, and you learn how to do things. And then there are the sculptors who love to make their own tools. Bob and Julie, I'm looking at you. Um, and who also are always experimenting to see if they can find something new.
If you're listening, Julie, how many sculptors do you think make their own tools? Like, what percentage of green sculptors? I know a lot of people have gone over to the 3D stuff, but a lot of them also learn messing around with green, right? It gets them interested in it. I wonder what percentage, or maybe maybe this is a better for, like, you know, in the... A decade ago, like, how many... When most sculptors were using green, what percentage do you think made their own tools? Yeah, um, I think all cutting mats have that, uh, Pendrake. And my other cutting mat is in half-inch uh, squares. I think it still has a scale along one side. Early on, most of them, that's what I thought. It seemed like everybody, like, because Gene used to make his own. Gene made my tiny spoon. Um, and then uh, Andy Peeper, when he was... He had a class on how to make your own tools. Now, once we get this set, guys, we're actually going to take a piece of plastic card and we're going to press this more or less flat. But I want to get it set up. We'll see. Uh, we'll probably need a little bit more green. I could really use anything, like, flat and resistant. I could use a piece of, like, um, just, like, the Reaper or a blister card. I think I've got a smaller piece of plastic card around here somewhere, though. So let me find that. Do, 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 do. You don't want to use paper, obviously, because it can stick. Plastic is better. Where did I put your plastic card? Ah, there you are. Let's see. Do I have a big piece? Yeah, I do. Sheet styrene, technically. Sheet styrene, folks. This is the big stuff, 1.5 millimeters thick. Thinner stuff is a little harder to use in this context. I do need to throw down some water or some, you can also use like things like Vaseline to keep it from sticking. I tend to just like reach for the water and uh, dab it on all over the place because now you're, you're pretty safe. Now I want to get the edge of this up here and I want to press it down and flatten what I can and try not to leave too many marks. What it will do is just give me a slightly flatter finish. Except if I let the edge dig in like that. Oh, yeah, and that actually, that green stuff is, is the one that had a little bit of water underneath it. So that we may need to work with because that's a problem. It's not an unsolvable problem, but it may involve us taking some of that green stuff up, drying it off, and redoing it. We'll see. See what we can do. But I want a little bit of a flatter. Yeah, see, and now we've pulled it off because it had water under it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that off. Sorry, green stuff. You have been flawed. Boom. It's always nice when I make, like, mistakes or things go wrong on stream because then you guys can see that, like, it's really no sweat. Like, it really isn't. It just is a thing. You just deal with it. I'm going to switch to my square clay shaper. Oh, cool, Julie. Thanks. I, w I can't wait to see what it is. I'm looking forward to ReaperCon. Should be fun. So this is a chisel shape clay shaper with a flat. I don't use it for very much, but I think it's quite good for this. Actually, this could be another sign also of, uh, of the world giving us a clue. If I wanted to put flagstones, old ancient flagstones on this, I've just created an indent um, accidentally. So why don't I use that to uh, create the start of my flagstones? That seems like a really good idea. So I'm just going to put a line there. And I'm going to grab a flat. Which flat do I want? I want this flat. I want to bring this out. Probably need a little more green. So I'm going to let that front area just dry because the cork definitely got wet. I can see it. So nothing's going to stick to it. I'm just going to let it go. Oh, 
Oh, it's just for blending the edge, but it also has the side effect of bonding the mini to the cork basement. I did glue the mini down as well. But I decided not to pin it because uh, I knew I was going to be green stuffing over its edge as well as gluing it. That still could come back to bite me if I drop it in the future. I want to get this top part more or less smoothed out. I don't need it to be super smooth because I do want it to have a little bit of stone texture. But I do want to get it pretty nice. I do want to bring it up to the edge. Blend, blend, blend. The thing about having Bob and Julian chat is I know that they probably would have a smarter way to do this, but <laughs> I have to make my own mistakes and learn, so. All right, there we go. So now I can pull this down, start kind of putting in. Another thing you can do is when you've got, and you know you're going to a crumbled edge here, right? Here, let me go down and get closer and uh, get in focus a bit. Okay, so when you know you're going for this crumbled edge here, you can grab your awesome chisel shape. Where's my awesome chisel shape? Here, this. Um, sharp spade. And start actually anything that you see that's a flaw, like maybe like I just did, you had to blend in a couple pieces of green and they're not perfectly blended. You can start introducing kind of like press down, Suggest that the stone has fallen away or gotten chipped in this area. And that's why that seam line is there. So, because it helps if you have a bit of a lead in to this crumbling edge here. So see how I'm making kind of those chisely shapes there? There, see it? You can see it really well there. So that's right along the line where these two pieces of putty are joining up. And I'm just like, I'm going to make this a feature, not a problem. And uh, as I mentioned, if I can kind of step this down into the rock work below, then it'll, it'll blend in more naturally with that crumbling edge. Especially if I decide not to skin this entire, if I decide to use a lot of the cork texture and not skin over this entire section. This is also a great time to think about cracks and other stuff. I do want to go th around and kind of make sure that I'm more or less flat, but I think I've I've worked the flat parts pretty well. I do need to clean up the areas close to her skirt, though. And we will need to redo this front section, but that's not a big deal. Base work, doing base work is such a good practice for doing conversions with green because you're, you have to do, like, you have to work with all the factors that you will when you are working with green on a figure trying to s actually sculpt some feature. You need to learn what you can do while the green is fresh, learn when you have to step away from the green to allow it to set up a little bit before you do more. You know, you'll learn, like, what consistency the green is at when, if you, if you try to pull it, you're going to get stringies. You know, you kind of learn about water and how to, or other, you know, whatever you're using for a lubricant, I use water, um, and how to deal with things like the water getting underneath the green and it not wanting to stick, you know, like what can I do next time to, to make that a little bit, um, you know, so it doesn't have as high chance of happening and stuff like that. All of these things, and you're, and you're doing basic shapes and they're organic shapes, so there's, there's no looking wrong when you're sculpting a rock. It's, it's just good practice for sculpting a whole bunch of stuff. And you get to play with the green. You get to learn when it stops being so sticky. It all works, right? So I do like think that base sculpting, like working with green in this kind of situation, is a really um, useful way to learn about using green for a whole bunch of things and learn sculpting. And the more you learn, if you are thinking about picking up ZBrush, 
the more you learn about like just working in 3D and how shapes are put together while you're working with green doing just basic conversions like that can help you later on when you start trying to figure out how how things are put together all right so that one got quite thin and just pull it down there's a lot of water there so i have to be very careful things like that things like using a light touch There we go, we're getting there. Pretty good. I think I'm gonna do lines for my flagstones. I'm gonna re-emphasize this line. I'm gonna get water on my spade and redo this line. Your uh, flagstones don't have to be perfect either. Especially if they're ruined. You can have quite a big bit of space between them. And you can put chips around the edges and all sorts of fun stuff. So I just want like the suggestion of old flagstones here. So I'm just going to mark those edges. And once I have them, then even when the green is set, I can go in and carve more. Although if I want anything, um, funny particular sculpted detail, then now is also a good time to do some of that. And I have to decide too, like, um, how I'm going to blend that in to the base down here. But first I just want to set it up. So I'm going to get a little closer. And you can also, if you go really lightweight with these lines, I mean, remember, you can always accentuate it with paint as well. There is always paint plastic surgery you can do to make these lines look heavier or bigger. I want another flat. I think I want a tiny spoon at this point. We will use some tiny spoon. I want to go over here and uh, pull this down make kind of a crumbled edge on this flagstone and bring it down into this crumbled rock here and I want to have some detail there so and then I can grab gentle angled spade and smooth out that area. Because it's a little flatter. And this is still pretty fresh green, so it's, it's keeping my tool marks. As green sets, you can do a lot more along these lines with the flattening without leaving tool marks. But I want that kind of, see that broken angle there? And I can bring a tiny spoon in or any, my X-Acto knife would be another good tool for this. But if I want to start bringing in cracks, either the edge of my tiny spoon or the uh, edge of my X-Acto knife is a good choice for bringing in cracks. Now, I don't want to go crazy with the cracks because I do want to do that summoning circle, right? So, 
Let's go back to the front now that my cork is a bit drier. Three thousand people for the otters. That's fantastic. Yay, otters. Good for them. That's a very big raid. But who doesn't want to watch otters? So, you know. Boop. Sit, stay, green stuff. It's a little less sticky now because it's starting to set up just a little, but it's still, still enough to uh, be worked with. So again, going to get some water on my tool. Going to not get quite as much water, remembering the last time the problem. Mostly I want this green stuff to cover up the space, though, so I don't care if I get a puddle out here on this cork, even though it will soak in. So we'll have to set this up and then let it sit for a bit. You can also just wick it off quick before it starts to absorb in there. Use my fingernail. And again, if we get any big fractures, now is the time to play with that. I do have a line, a flagstone line back here that I can kind of link up to this ruined area up here where the two green sections intersect. So I want my, I want to kind of look at it, kind of pull that line right through. It's going to come out probably here. Grab my other tool. So what this is going to become is just a ruined this whole section is just going to be crumbling. This whole section of rock. I'm going to take it and make it all kind of ruined. Make a big gap there. And this is the fun part. Like when you have to adjust, when you have to, when things aren't working out and you end up with like, a part that looks like Uki and you're just like, okay, this is a ruined section, but do put the extra effort into it to make it look like a ruined section. Don't just leave your big blorf and try to paint it appropriately. Actually like do some texture work and try to imply that it's just a shattered piece of rock. Take advantage of every feature, every random feature so that that might be useful. Another way you can just get it flat is by gentle pressure back and forth with a flat-ish tool instead of the plastic card. At this point, since I'm doing a specific section, I'm just going to use that. It's a little bit more difficult to get used to. You have to like be very even with your pressure, but it's not impossible. Once again, um, as I get like out from around her, I'm going to start suggesting that the edges of this uh, piece of stone are crumbling. Like she barely had enough room to draw a decent summoning circle here is kind of the message that I want to send. And there's a crack here, so I'm probably actually going to carve that deeper when uh, everything is set. I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to flatten out some of this stone. I'm going to think about putting texture on it now. So I just want to make sure it's more or less flat. Or at least it's reading relatively flat. It's easy to get kind of blobby with green stuff, especially when it's fresh. It just tends to want to give you a little bit of blobbiness just because it's so gooey. All right. 
right, so now let's grab one of our bigger pieces of cork with an interesting texture. And let's uh, kind of have that. Really lightly, I'm going to use this to add texture to the top of these flagstones. It's just a real lightweight texture. I'm not pressing very much. I just want a little bit of irregularity that can work with the um, parts that I've already sculpted so that it's not flat and it also serves to disguise any tool marks I have left. This is why I love cork is like you can use it as a stamp or you can use it as the rock. And it's so small and you could totally just like tear out a little piece that's the perfect size for what you need. So that's getting there, guys. That's getting there. Of course, paint is going to bring even more of it out. And I do need to put in a line here. I forgot. I've got a flagstone that comes right down the middle. So kind of drawing that line. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be close. It is ruined, so you have a little leeway. But as long as the, it seems logical, like a logical continuation, you really don't have to be perfectly lined up. And with a grid, which is such a, a an instinctual construction for us humans, you really do not need to be perfect. Like, we want to see it, so we'll see it. It's a shape we recognize very readily. Now I'm going to correct all of the... Uh, all the little things that I may have forgotten to do. Like to establish a grid line here. That one I think is a little mushy. You also can shove these lines a little bit, by the way, while your green is still fresh. If you think that a line got a little bit too much right or left, you can kind of squoosh the putty right next to it to adjust it just a little bit. So flagstones in place, and technically they probably have another one like cut off over here, but since we are on the edge of our precipice, we're just going to pretend that that is the edge of the flagstone right there, and that it goes down the side. And this, of course, is a busted one. That's perfect. So yeah, she's on a piece of ancient flooring from some ruin that she's standing in. And once this green is cured, I can go back with fresh green and add details and smooth stuff out and build it up even more. Yeah, I, that's for later, though, I think, Pendrake. Like, I tend to do in stages. With When you're working with green, you're working in stages, right? You're not going to get the whole thing done in one go. You really, at this point, this is where I'm, like, kind of saying, oh, wow, I've almost, I'm almost done with the stream. I just looked at the clock. I'm, like, I was so entranced with all this that it went past break time, past any time. We have less than 10 minutes left. So this is perfect, actually, to talk about the fact that um, at this point, this is probably where I would stop. I would maybe uh, adjust a couple things still, like this little, uh, this little area being a little rough. So I, maybe I want to take that area and make it a little broken or I want to adjust that line. Um, but this is the point where I'd just stop. I'd kind of spend the last bit uh, of time refining. Like you say, there is a little bit of smooshing down the side, but I'm more likely to come back in and do more of this. Like, because I want to do um, like this, this uh, fissure here. I want this to be cart pump, like part of a broken flagstone. I want to take my knife and actually slice out a bit of this and uh, and come back like with that kind of effect. Uh, but I don't want to do that when the green is fresh. There's just, it's just too risky uh, for messing up what I've already done that I like. So, but yeah, you totally can go in from the edge and disguise it like I started to do here. And I'm going to just 
do a little bit of texturing blending in on that, but I, I don't want to mess it up. So I do need to be a little careful. This line kind of shoved itself this way. So I'm going to grab my, um, when you're trying to do a softer adjustment, using these uh, clay shapers is kind of nice. But this chisel is, uh, and these are the extra firm clay shapers. So they do have a bit of punch to them, but they're also a little bit softer. I mean, they're softer than steel. So I need to push this flagstone out so I get a nice shape. This is where you can go around and kind of adjust your flagstones. Make sure make sure all your grout laying was, you know, perfectly in line and all the rest of it. Nope, I haven't done the magic circle yet, Basement Forge. Um, I decided I wanted to carve it out of the green. So I'm not going to mess up. I want Right now I want to really set, set my stones in stone. Um, we'll have another basing. I mean, for sure there's more than one basing video on this one. But it's much easier, like carving into green is pretty easy. And since this doesn't have to go on mold, we can carve to our heart's content. So right now, I want to get these uh, flagstones really tightened up, looking good. As even as I can get them. But we have less than, I mean... We have seven minutes, so we're not going to get to Magic Circle yet. But yeah, I think I'm going to do Magic Circle with a very light carved line on the green. Or, hmm, now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, since I've chosen this route, the other thing I could do is try to make the circle look like chalk. Like, just paint it on, but paint it on, like, and try to get a chalk texture with it, that rough texture. That could be kind of fun. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about what I want to do. Like, it depends on if I want to make it chalk, or I want to make it glow, or I want to make it scratched into the surface, like I was originally thinking. There's all these choices. I think that's about right. Be aware that when you do uh, press your tool down into the green, it is going to make um, slight ridges show up on either side. So you need to kind of flatten those in. Right. I don't know if I want to do a carved in a hurry or if I don't. Depends on the story, right, Basement? She may have had time to prepare or she may not have had time to prepare. So then we have to think about the story that we're telling. Chalk would be fast. So I'm just taking the edges of my spade tool and I'm just damping down wherever I've raised up putty from putting, uh, putting these lines in. Just kind of smoothing it out a little bit. If I get a little wobbly on my line, I'll gently come back to correct it. So yeah, it depends on the story we're telling. I haven't quite decided uh, how I want that to be. There's two ways to decide. You can decide based on story or you can decide based on effect. If you want to do like a glow effect, then, you know, there are certain ways that doing that would make more sense. You know, and maybe you make your decision based on that. If you're making your decision based on a story... Like that she was out exploring a ruin for like ancient magic and got, uh, you know, then was suddenly surprised by the approach of monsters or an enemy party. Or an adventuring party that was liable to see her as a monster and not an adventurer. Then she would definitely go for something faster. So yeah, it all depends. You've got very little, um, very little room to tell a story. But you do have some room, so 
I do like her. I like her an awful lot. I think she's, uh, I think this is going to be a cool base. Well, but it doesn't mean she hasn't been camped here and she didn't already have a circle drawn. Like, you know, you could go either way. It's, it's, is she readying herself suddenly or was she ready for this encounter? Like, that's really the, in my mind, the choice. That's the, the question, right? All right, let's see here. Yeah, I think this is going to be a cool base, guys. Like, we've just gotten a good start on it. Do you see, though, how the use of the cork raises her up, makes her taller? When you have a small, simple figure like this, adding some height to it, it can really make it more interesting. Um, makes it more of a vertical composition. You've added in some interesting texture. We're going to add in some interesting details as well. Um, we've offset her in a different position, which as we discussed earlier, you know, adds again to the visual interest of her so that she's not just a flat figure looking off to the side. It also encourages us to look at her slightly at an angle. Um, it could be anything, right? Some things you're not going to be able to tell that story, Agent Marvel, unless you like actually write a story to go along with it. Like if you have backstory then you need to tell it like David did with his, um, you guys remember the, uh, come back to me, my love diorama that he did with the necromancer bringing her love back to life. He wrote a little story to go with that because otherwise they're just things that you would not get from, you might not get from the diorama itself. But so anything outside, anything you can't directly portray, anything like that, like that, you could possibly create the illusion that the circle is crumbling the stone, but then you're going to have to paint it differently. And I would probably, I'd probably do some extra stuff to suggest that. But then I'd have to ask myself, you know, like, I don't know, like it would have to be a part of kind of like the story for me. Like it would have to be that this is a place that was destroyed by magic. That's constantly being destroyed by magic. That's still being destroyed by magic, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and that might be like harder to convey. So otherwise I think I'm, I'm pretty happy with the start on there. Again, once it's all set, I could take additional green into it and build it up more. If I want more of a thick layer of green and I want it more to be more level because it is necessarily slightly slanting because it's covering up the bottom of her base. Uh, then I can do that. I've got this start here that I can build on top of if I want to, or I can just go ahead with what I've got. So, and there's still lots of questions like there's, am I going to build out the flagstone onto here? Am I going to mostly crumble this? You know, am I going to add other chunks onto the base? Uh, since I did save some smaller chunks, am I going to uh, kind of come on and and add some of that back on. Um, so for a little bit more interest, visual interest, even a little bit of fallen stone can help with that visual interest there and to break up that space. So things like that, questions we have yet to ask. Um, so that's what we did today, guys. We've talked about uh, composition. We talked about green work, about tools and shapes, uh, about water and applying it as a lubricant on this stuff. Um, about glues and how it affects cork, about different kinds of cork that you can use, of the various usefulnesses of cork. Um, much of the chat was talking about the hazards of working with uh, styrofoam in various types with uh, spray cans. So if you're interested about that, you can go back in the VOD and read the chat. Um, but yeah, that is what we covered today. And it is, uh, it's been a great one. This was so much fun that I didn't even look at the clock until it was 10 minutes to end. <laughs> oh yeah and don't forget the crafty creative with josh foreman and also uh at 4 p.m central i'll be on my own channel over at twitch.tv slash painting big i also have a patreon patreon.com slash painting big you all are welcome over there i know a lot of you are already over there and thank you so much for your support all right have a great Thursday. Tomorrow is Friday, people. Woohoo! Be excited about it. I hope you all have lovely, fantastic days. All right. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. There we go. Bye bye.